Let me ask you if you would take out of your materials the green sheet. And we'll start with that this afternoon. And let me outline the purpose as you take out that green sheet. The purpose this afternoon is to use a couple of examples of intervention plans and the green sheet is one such plan. It's a summary of a school's intervention plan and we'll be using a second one. And we're going to be looking at those intervention plans to identify what it was that the schools in those summaries, the green one first, what it was that the school concentrated on in terms of its evaluation. We'll then move from those two plans, the green one first and the other one's a purple one, but we'll get to that later on. It might be an orange one, I'll just come to it in a minute. No, it's, a per it's an orange one, yes. Um, we'll come to the orange one later. We'll move from those two plans then to what is it that we are suggesting you use as a template for planning back at school. I'll follow then that template for planning back at school with one school's example of their evaluation plan. Then, when we've finished that, John will actually show you some examples of the report that that plan produced. Does that make sense with the logic going down that way? Uh, so we're going to start back here with the green one and I'd like you to take uh, just a couple of minutes to read the green one and then I'll draw your attention to some of its features that have been drawn into that school's evaluation. This is a real school from the original PAL pilot. It's not called on the money school by the way. Okay, so let me make a couple of points about this uh, school. Bear in mind that the evaluation process that we're asking you to lead says that there are a couple of primary purposes. Trying to understand what changes or developments there have been in teaching and learning before understanding or as well as understanding what improvements or changes in children's achievement there have been. In this particular case you can immediately see the focus of the intervention. You can see that it concerns years three, five and seven and years four and six. So it's in the middle to upper end of the primary school, it's not down on the lower end. So clearly you'd be able to focus your key questions towards the middle to upper end of the primary school in comprehension strategies. So what I'm attempting to draw your attention to here is that out of all of the material that Desley presented to you in the last session, you've got to be quite selective about what it is you go ahead and evaluate. I mean, wasn't there a wealth of stuff in the information that was contained in all of the possibilities for the gathering of data. No, no, no. You've got your intervention. Here in this particular case, you could see strongly the focus on the middle to upper primary school, and it's about comprehension. So your purposes must be directed towards that. Okay, so when you've got your intervention plan, be guided by your plan about the purposes, and don't go far too broadly because you will have the evaluation tail wagging the teaching dog and you don't want it to do that. Okay, so if you look then at this, the primary purposes would be clear. What, what achievement changes or improvements have there been in children's comprehension across those years? And then what are uh, some of the changes or things that we're seeing in teaching practices that have contributed to comprehension. And look, at you can find a secondary purpose now that comes from the Leadership for Learning dimension. If you go into there, look across on the right-hand side and you'll see providing resources such as comprehension strategy charts. You'll see that all comprehension strategies will have active professional development opportunities for teachers. That was one of their planned supports for the intervention and that there would be training for teacher age in some aspects of those comprehension strategies. If you go a little further into the green document, you'll see that there's some wave one, wave two and wave three activity and in order to use the school's resources, there's been a timing issue here structured in, hasn't there? Some in semester one, some in semester two. 
but all teachers and children are going to be exposed to uh, the same language, the same kinds of comprehension strategy charts that uh, the school has decided to employ. And these are some of, this is just from this particular school. Uh, they elaborated these over time, but everybody started with these kinds of things. Uh, one of the schools actually uh, elaborated this into, and I'll mention the name of the school because it's quite public now, it's often used in uh, other schools uh, in my home state, the Beanley Building Blocks for Comprehension. Beanley is just the name of the school, Beanley State School, and they use the Beanley Building Blocks. They've elaborated on specific strategies in each of these uh, areas. I always ask somebody why the skeleton was there with respect to analysis and, uh, and somebody uh, told me that it was breaking things down to its bare bones. So um, on the money, uh, that school, I'm going to provide you with uh, a brief discussion on some sample data. Now if you open uh, your, uh, your folders to uh, what I've uh, included here, which is a purple sheet. It's a teacher's comprehension check which was actually run at this school and you are to follow it with the orange sheet which is the children's comprehension check. So you'll recognise this that part of their strategy was to have professional learning for teachers and then to make sure that all of those charts and there was explicit exposure to some of these, to all of these aspects of comprehension in these year levels. I'd like you to examine those two pages for the data that is there that has been drawn from this evaluation and I'd like you to have a conversation using you, your three discipline dialogue questions. That is, what are we seeing in these data from teachers? What are we seeing in these data from children? Why are we seeing what we are and what, if anything, should we do about it? Um, let me just give you one pointer here if you look at the purple sheet, you'll see that in analysing, there are four sub-strategies, A, B, C and D. Have you got those? OK, if you go over to the orange sheet, it is only those four sub-strategies that have been asked of the children. Now, they did much more than this. I've just picked these out for the purpose of this afternoon. Is that, that uh, clear enough for you? So two little... Uh, sample sets of data. I'd like you to look at them carefully and I'd like you to spend five minutes on the first question, what are we seeing here? Five on the second, what if anything, I'm sorry, wh why are we seeing what we are? And third, what if anything could be done about it? Now, assuming you understand the context, you would if you were around the table at that school. So there are your three questions and you've got um, it, about 15 minutes, but I may call you back around about 12. So read inwardly to Jess and away you go. Let me uh, just say that what I've done there by getting you just to have a look at that little bit of data is not that I'm interested in you really worrying about that data at the moment, but it is that the process of evaluation will produce evidence for you about a significant purpose for which you have focused the evaluation. In this case, if you were leading that school and you were spending some of your resource and your time on the professional learning of teachers with common language and strategies about uh, comprehension across the year levels, you would want to know something about the effect and take up you were having, wouldn't you? So if it were something on which you had invested time, energy and sometimes funds, other resources, then clearly you'd make it a partial focus of your evaluation along with the children's achievement and particular teaching strategies that are being employed. So that school did and, and this is an example, if you like, of the notion of the SMART tool that I introduced you to in I think module one so long ago. It's where you try to get a couple of perspectives on, a, on the same matter. So here it is, you've got some child perspectives and you've got some teacher perspectives. It gives an edge to the discussion because you get views that are important to take into account. Now where you can get child, parent, teacher, 
support staff, if those people figure prominently in some aspect of the intervention that you're doing, then you do it only for the matter which you know you've invested time, energy, effort and so on in. So be selective about where you target your data gathering on the particular purpose which you believe in the intervention you've been trying to serve influentially. So let me just say, remind you that's a smart tool. Multiple perspectives on a similar item, smart tool. Let me take you to Up and Up Primary School. I'd like you to spend just about three minutes reading this summary of another school's intervention. You'll see it's also concentrating on comprehension because I've got to tell you that in the original PAL pilot project, schools tended to go into the upper dimensions uh, the upper levels of primary schooling more than in the lower levels, but about at least a third of the schools in the pilot project concentrated on the first three of the big six. Very little was done, you'd agree with this, very little was done on fluency in the pilot project. Uh, a bit more on uh, vocabulary, as you would expect. Uh, quite a deal in the upper primary school on comprehension. Down in the lower school, of course, we had the first two of the first three of the big six getting a fair degree of um, traction. So just read that and I'll come back to a couple of points. Okay, let me just draw your attention to a couple of things here now. Uh, the middle phase of learning is a Queensland term. Early phase, middle phase, senior phase, right? Um, the middle phase of learning usually refers, or it does refer in Queensland to years four, five, six, and seven. Okay, so they've got uh, identified here years four, five, and six in this particular school. If you were going to be organising your evaluation in this school, apart from looking at children's achievement in comprehension again, you would clearly look at whether or not staff have a better understanding of the use of data on comprehension through discussions and discipline dialogue, wouldn't you? You'd want to gather some information about that, whether or not they really do use the data to help them backward map into strategies for teaching those children for whom the data yields important clues about future learning. So on the right hand side, down at the second last paragraph, it says two by 30 minute lessons per week. Now that's a cost. You've developed time to be devoted to that and there's some energy uh, and effort going into that. My suspicion would be you would want to know the extent to which that was being helpful. So you would gather some data about that specific strategy that is part of the intervention. What have the effects of that been? And that would tell you that the source would be those children and the teachers who were having um, in-class uh, support for those children, two by 30 minutes. And then the last one, I'm going to draw your attention to this. This is the first one and it one was one of very few in the PAL pilot project where the school specifically went out of its way to do something with parents. We had a number of schools who tried, but this was one of few, uh, tried to make the linkages, but this was one of few who went about doing some evaluation to find out what the effects might be. So they've got parent information sessions and publication of a booklet for parents to support comprehension work done at school. There's two things about which you can see whether or not they were effective. So obviously you need to, do, to put some kind of data gathering process in place to gather data from the parents who are involved in those things. If you have a look at uh, this slide, here are some key questions that you might ask if you were wanting to follow up that particular matter. What parents are involved who are involved in the booklet sessions and in doing something as a result? Are parents seeing anything that happens at home as a result of what they've been doing? What problems do they encounter? Are there other things that you might be doing ultimately when you found out the problems they encounter that you could be doing differently from the school point of view? Look at the second last one. Is there a correlation between children enjoying support at home and movement from baseline or benchmark achievement data. 
that will make the data here conform to that uh, Robinson and Timperley notion of a smart tool because you'll have data from the children and data on which parents are supporting children at home. That would be very interesting for you to see and would probably provoke a very useful discussion at school about what are we what, what can can we sorry what can we confirm here or affirm and then what can we recommend that we might do differently as a result of what we see. So those two examples I just used because they underscore the idea that when you look around the leadership for learning dimensions into the areas of professional learning or parent connections, you may wish to gain data about those things. If you look at the other dimensions of the leadership for learning blueprint, the conditions of learning, you may wish to gain some information about the conditions of learning. If there's been a real thrust in the school on changing, as Desley was was, argue, uh, was suggesting, the nature of the way classrooms look, and there's a lot of effort on that, well, there's a, there's a, a very important uh, source of data from the children and the teachers about what it is, is uh, what is the effect of that. So you use the Leadership for Learning blueprint as the source of those secondary questions Given that, the most automatic questions we will go to will be what are we seeing in changes on children's achievement in comprehension, in this case, and what are we seeing in terms of changes in teachers' practice towards comprehension. So they're, they're givens when you know the focus of the evaluation. OK, so I'm just going to hold on that now and I'm going to take a slightly different tack, but I'm asking you to take out the pink sheet next. This big A3 pink sheet. And this is the sheet that we're going to ask you to use as a beginning point for planning your evaluation. It replicates the three fundamentals of evaluation across the top, purpose, process and use. It provides you with the two primary purposes, primary purpose one and two, and it allows room for the secondary purpose of your choice below. And where do you make your choices from? Well, those dot points down below. All right, I would like you to spend just a few minutes to have a reaction to that planning template, and then I'm going to show you an example of it completed, and I'll make some comments about that. So you've got about uh, three or four minutes, maybe five minutes, to just look at that and Talk about it for yourselves as a starting point. Do you have to do exactly this? No. Is it a useful starting point? What might you need uh, to think about as you go about leading planning using such a document back at your school? All right, so four or five minutes just as a reaction to that pink sheet. All right, I've given you the pink sheet as a, a way into looking at an actual example. If you go into your package, you'll find uh, a white stapled paper with some coloured ellipses on the top, which repeat the purpose, process and use elements of evaluation. Got a blue line down the side or a blue bar down the side. This is an actual piece of work and it is linked to one of the two examples that I showed you before. So what you've got here is the evaluation plan produced by one school using the pink, the pink A3 sheet. Everybody with me? Okay, what we're, what we're trying to do here is reduce the amount of consideration that needs to be given to the planning process. So primary purpose one, you'll see on the left-hand side here, says to find out about changes in the middle phase teaching and learning experience in which children are engaging and their effects. 
Very simple. You would know what your intervention has been about. You would be able to insert your primary purpose number one. Go over the page and we'll see primary purpose number two. I'm going to come back in a minute. Primary purpose number two, to ascertain if there are any changes being seen in children's achievement in reading. Well, that's what we're about, isn't it? If you go over the page to the back page, you'll see they have one secondary purpose. And that secondary purpose has come from the dot point list down below. To ascertain influence in changes, that's influence on changes, typo, uh, in school approach to coordinating and monitoring the literacy curriculum and teaching on teaching and learning. So they've got a number of things that they're gathering some evidence on there. So let's go back to the front. And I'll ask you to spend about five minutes just reading primary purpose number one and particularly having a look at the data methods that have been identified as necessary to yield sufficient information about primary purpose number one. And you'll see that they've even brain brainstormed some items for some questionnaires in that planning process. So just page one and then over to the middle, just below the middle of page two. So take some time to read that for about five minutes or so. This was a very big school. Uh, this school had over, this is Queensland for you, this, this school had over 1,100 kids in it. So there was a fair bit of uh, structural support available here. My emphasis to you is that if you are going to do nothing else in your evaluation, you would gather data about primary purpose one and two. What is occurring in children's achievement in the focus area of your intervention? And what have been the influences or effects of your intervention on teaching and learning? If there is a very influential dimension of the Leadership for Learning blueprint that you have factored into your intervention and on which you have spent resources, time, effort and energy, and sometimes money, then you make a decision with your teachers about the extent to which you will collect data on that, because that may inform you about the structures you employ, the money you spend, and the effort or energy and time that you dedicate to that particular act action. So. You, you need to be quite consciously deliberate as leaders of the evaluation planning process of where the priority purposes lie. And they certainly lie on primary purpose one and two. And then moving into something else if it's terribly important to the intervention. So the interesting thing here is in the material that we've produced for you, uh, that evaluation guide from that school shows that they've got quite a deal of, will gather quite a deal of data, and they produced a larger, more comprehensive report than we asked for. Um, you need to be, in your leadership of the evaluation, clear in your mind with your teachers that what you evaluate, from whom you gather, gather the data, and how you make use of it, using discipline dialogue, because that's what you, you will employ with the data you get, that that's going to take us a little further in our planning for the future for children, whether it be in wave one across the school or wave two or wave three children. So the pink planning sheet, do you have to complete it? You have to complete your own version of it if you're going to conduct an evaluation and it's up to you to decide how you do that, make amendments to it, adjustments to it as you see fit. Um, I'm going to take you then through to the final part of uh, this task because obviously if you've conducted an evaluation, you would at school, probably not in, uh, a, in a report form, you would sit and discuss the data that had been gathered at particular meetings, wouldn't you? And you would work your way forward in terms of what needs to be commended and what needs to be 
thought about to do differently. And you do do that in, in uh, staff together time or team time where you've got the evaluation team working with you to do so. We're asking you for a brief report and I'll put the headings up here. We're looking for no more than a five page report. You can add in some appendices that have been part of your data gathering by all means. And look at what, we've, uh, what we're asking for you here. You'll need to put a small number of paragraphs about the context of your report. By the way, the reporting format is contained in your module. If you go into that to save you making a note, it's on page 21, where I've just reproduced the slide here. So page 21. And it shows you that in the context, you can probably draw that from uh, your own prospectus statement that you've got. The school's context, what kind of a school is it, what's its size, who does it draw from, what's the nature of it, uh, what's your overall focus. Number two, definition of the, or description of the problem. Uh, this is trying to look at the evidence base that suggests to you that it's the first three of the big six that your school is concentrating on in years uh, one and two, or whatever the focus of your intervention has been. What's the evidence that suggests that that is a problem area really worthy of intervention? So you've already got that, you've been talking about that, you've been putting your interventions in place. That's a very short description. You should probably be able to pull that from your intervention plan. Then the purpose, that's where you go into the pink sheet and you've got your primary and secondary purposes. So you just put down the purposes of your evaluation and if you've got any key questions like some of those that you've seen examples of, you just insert those in there from your evaluation plan. Brief description of your data collection methods. We got, we use these assessment, uh, these student assessment checks. We use these kinds of data gathering processes to get information from children themselves about their learning or about th the experiences they'd had of their learning. We use these to get information from our teachers. Uh, if we went beyond that to um, uh, others in the school as well as parents, well, this is what we did. And then we're not expecting that, you know, like in university assignments, you go through a whole array of data presentation. You might include some of your data in appendices, but what really is of interest for um, those understanding what you've been doing is what conclusions did you come to from your reflection upon the data? So you just put in those conclusions and we ask you to put them under two headings. What did our, our data tell us that was worthwhile making sure we continue to do? Perhaps even expanding or enhancing what we've been doing there because it's, it's been doing well for us. And then what are those things that we might take forward into the next iteration of our intervention? Because the evaluation should, by the end of November, it should tell you some things that would be very worthwhile you're putting into place for the new school year. So your evaluation of interventions should not occur any more than once a year. And as you go about monitoring children's work along the way, clearly that would factor into your overall evaluation of changes in children's achievement. So I think what I'm trying to, to say here is that out of the broad array of possibilities, be selective about what you focus on for the evaluation be sure that you need to know as a leader what it is that has been happening in achievement, in teaching and learning and in any other aspect that comes from your secondary purpose. Don't be bound up with the notion that this is a, an exercise that has to conform to the notions of validity, reliability and reproducibility. No, they're researchers' concepts. What your evaluation should conform to is, will the data be sufficient on what we're trying to do to open up professional conversation with us so we can identify ways forward and get satisfaction out of what we're doing well? I use the term, I think, in um, Module 1, which I really like um, better than uh, Helen, um, Helen Timperley's uh, problem talk notion. I like the idea of data as tin openers 
to get the conversation out of the can. So that's the level of robustness that your evaluation should be seeking so that you get good quality professional conversations using discipline dialogue that helps you reflect forward, reflect backwards and then plan forwards for uh, future work. So this particular uh, page 21, just to finish up now, uh, says that uh, we're looking for you to complete this and uh, John, I think it's by the end of November, is it? Oh, so it's uh, October the 31st. So look at my, my slide, which I have amended. October the 31st might be a good date, John says. Um, John, do, you'll say more about uh, celebration and so on later on. Uh, so five pages. Look, some people did more than five pages in uh, the original PAL pilot project. But you can see from those headings we're asking for something that I think you'll realise is a very technical description of this evaluation. We're asking for the guts of it. Right? Those five headings are the guts of what you're doing, even though you'll have a lot of conversation around it. Okay, I'm going to finish here.